Hello and welcome to the i3 podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. For more information about our educational forums for institutional investors, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. There you can also subscribe to our complimentary newsletter, i3 Insights in which we discuss investment strategy and asset allocation questions with asset owners around the world. Now, as you all know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. This recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to the i3 Insights podcast. My name is Daniel Grioli and I'm the Market Fox columnist for i3 Insights. I'd like to give a big thank you to our steadily growing group of listeners. We'd be very grateful if you'd tell your friends and colleagues about the i3 podcast. Thanks for your support. You can follow us on Twitter at i3 Invest and at Market underscore Fox. Today I'm joined by Simon Russell. He's the founder and director of Behavioural Finance Australia. Simon has a unique set of skills. His academic background is in psychology and finance, and he has a career spent in investment banking, asset consulting, and now consulting with clients on all things behavioural finance. He's the author of two books, Applying Behavioural Finance in Australia and Cyborg, How to Optimally Integrate Human and Machine Investment Decision Making. Simon, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much for having me. It's great to have you here. And we usually start off by asking our guests a little bit about their background. So where did it start for you from a psychology perspective, but also an investment perspective? I guess from a psychology perspective, well, that was my first degree at university. So I I went in thinking, do I want to be a psychologist? Well, I don't know, but it looks quite interesting. So I just picked up um, uh, a bunch of psychology psychology subjects in first year and then found them to be fascinating and continued through. So I ended up with a degree majoring in psychology, I guess, originally. And in, I think some of the stuff that I did back then is now well dated and, and probably quite irrelevant uh, in terms of what we now know about how the brain works, for example. But some of it's really quite as relevant today as it was when I studied it back in the 90s and and to be honest some of the studies are are well precede when I studied them back then. So that was sort of I guess in terms of the psychology grounding. Thereafter everything else was finance investments related. I went back and did a commerce degree, a grad dip, a master's applied finance. I was working asset consulting as you said in the introduction. So everything else really was I guess finance investments but really with that underlying psychology lens on decision making in the context of super funds choosing asset managers, asset managers building portfolios, corporates raising debt, funding M&A. Um, so I guess the psychology gave me a lens on the world as I went through the, um, the finance investment sort of world through my career. Um, and then what was it, about five years or so, I guess now ago, um, the position I had, well, not just my position, but all of the roles in our team were made uh, redundant. And I thought, well, fantastic, here's a chance to go back, combine some of the underlying psychology, which I, I guess I had a grounding in from way back when, but have kept in touch with through that period. Combine that with some of the sort of emerging aspects in behavioral finance, which wasn't really a subject that was available when I studied psychology. I did psychology and finance in separate departments. Now they've come together to form behavioral finance. So about five years ago, I said, well, I'm going to combine these two things. I see there's a big gap between what we should be doing in a sort of normative sense, the sort of fully rational view of the world versus the the descriptive, what actually are we doing? Uh, I don't know how I'm going to help try and bring those two things closer together. There's a lot of value in potentially being able to do so. I'll see what I can do. I'll I'll build a business around that. I guess that that was my thinking. 
That's interesting. So I want to ask you a bit more about how you built your business a little later. But first, I want to circle back on something that you said there. You mentioned that you, you're working in finance. You came from a psychology background. I'm assuming back then most of your peers would have come from either an accounting or a quantitative or a finance background. And you're probably the only person there from a psychology background. If so, what was that like? working in finance when awareness of behavioral finance was not what it is today yeah interesting I mean, I, I, even if i take a step further back than that i think it's i was somewhat of of an outsider all the way through so for example when i was first started studying psychology i wasn't just doing psychology i, I was also i took a subject in maths a subject in statistics and those were in the maths department so I'm the sort of interloper into the maths department from the sort of the arts faculty. Who the hell are you? What do you, what do you know about maths? And then when I go and study economics, what the hell are you doing here from the, the, the arts faculty again and the social sciences as it was back then studying economics? So combining those things, I think, made it a bit, made me a bit of an outsider in each of those different contexts. But then to come into the investment space, um, I don't think I was branded or saw myself as the psychology guy. I mean, I guess at that point I had a commerce degree in finance and investments at that stage, half a law degree. So I sort of already was a bit of a mixed bag. And I think that the psychology stuff almost gets pushed into the background. It wasn't really at the forefront of what you're doing day to day. If anything, I think it's the it was the underlying analytical skills that came from psychology and understanding sort of decision making which through university I, I mean I had a market research role part-time as I was going through which started to combine sort of some of the psychology about how people are making decisions with then commercial market sort of uh, driven outcomes at least in that case in, in the context of market research so I don't think I was in that I didn't see myself as the sort of the outsider sort of psychology guy I sort of saw myself as a finance investment guy but to be honest I'm just a graduate st starting in I know nothing everybody knows I know nothing <laughs> I think I, 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 don't, I don't think I was much different from anybody else at, at that time and in terms of what you were doing and what you were seeing others doing around you whether it be in your own organization or in the market more broadly how did having that background in psychology that that different way of looking things change the way you interpreted what was going on around you yeah I, I think I think it did because when you look at some of the psychology you see well your brain actually comprises a fair chunk of sort of subconscious processing a lot of stuff happens that you're not actually consciously aware of you can tease out when you put people in lab experiments and uh, and the like so it makes you somewhat skeptical of what really what, what what really is driving our decisions? How much of it is going on beyond our awareness? I guess, I guess that's a theme that comes out of the psychology. So if you take that theme uh, and apply it in the context of now I'm working with a whole bunch of people who seem to know what they're doing, well, I guess you set, sort of start to become more sceptical. Do they really? Is there stuff going on behind the scenes? So with that in mind, I guess, I mean, I started out my first role out of university was an asset as an asset consultant. Uh, and I started out, I guess, thinking that everybody knew what they were talking about. Um, and How long did it take to yourself of that illusion? Uh, well, my asset co consulting career was relatively short, <laughs> so it probably didn't Fast take... Fast learner. <laughs> well, it wasn't a popular thing to have learned, but I mean, I guess I became quite sceptical quite quickly about uh, the ability of the asset managers we were meeting with every day to beat the markets. So that's not to say that none could, of course, but... The, the broad evidence is certainly what I'm aware of is that most can't. And how do we go about finding which ones can and which ones can't? Well, actually, I thought our ability to, to pick them was pretty poor as well. So sort of two levels of scepticism came in. So I started questioning the value of at least the part of asset consulting that I was involved in, manager selection, uh, I guess, in that respect, which is not to say the rest of the stuff we were doing w was um, – without value but that piece I sort of really struggled to see how we were really adding value and I think the psychology added to that because you're sort of thinking well if we're overconfident for example one of the resounding things that um, that seems to come from um, various types of decision making we're overconfident we think we know more than we are more than we do then that sort of gives you I get it that gets a bit of a grounding as to what might be going on we, we think we're getting this stuff right but actually when we go back and look at the evidence for it it's, it's actually a bit weaker than we might think or hope so Coming back to 
five years ago at the end of your last job for a boss, now you're self-employed, and you had this idea, as you said, about creating a business around behavioral finance. Where did you start? I started with the research literature, which gave me a sense that there is a massive, massive gap in many cases, which, depending on which study you, you, you look at, could be billions of dollars in aggregate or hundreds of thousands of dollars for individuals. So really, really material differences um, between sort of optimal decision making and, and what people are actually doing. So I looked at that and thought there's value in here at an individual level, an aggregate level through various parts of the financial services investment spectrum. But how then do you create a value proposition that people are willing to employ me for? So I didn't have a boss anymore, but effectively you've always got bosses when you've got clients. Um, so how do I find clients who are willing to value something that I can do that will help to close that gap? And I really had no idea at what what that value proposition would be, who would be to. Who, who. So I started out thinking maybe it's individual investors, maybe I need some sort of scaled self-managed super fund decision-making tool, uh, but found that quite difficult from a technology perspective, from a marketing perspective, there's everybody out there in that sort of space. So I quickly moved on then to just saying, well, let me, let me just present the evidence, present the ideas, present what potentially some of the opportunities are for closing this gap and how we can add value and run run some workshops just see who comes um, and I guess what I found from those workshops was well for a start there was quite a lot of interest which was pleasing it would have been disheartening if maybe maybe rocked up uh, so, that, so that was good um, but then who rocked up and what I found was in those early sessions that I ran about half of the people who came along to those sessions were financial advisors so I thought okay there's a value proposition uh, for financial advisors and the other half were a real mixed bag. So I had, I don't know, there were a couple of asset managers, there'd be a couple of super funds, there'd be an accountant, there'd be a, 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 a management consultant or investment banker, a whole range sort of, of this potpourri. So I looked at that thinking, okay, I've got financial advisors who, to be honest, were mostly interested in the client engagement stuff. How do I help my clients? How do I better engage with my clients around their decision making? Whereas the others were all interested in a whole range of different things. And when I came out of one of those sessions, and I, to be honest, I jam-packed so much stuff into a day that I just was running helter-skelter to get through it all. And I sat down with a few of the guys at the end of it saying, well, can I get rid of some of this client engagement stuff? That sort of seemed to go on for too long. And I'd, I'd have a couple of people say, no, 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 that was the best part. You should leave that in there. And I'd say, well, can I get rid of some of this investment stuff? And then somebody else would say, no, 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 that was the best part. You should leave that in there. So, I, well, I guess what I found is that there's a whole lot of stuff which has value to different people in different contexts. And so I, my journey since then really has been to try and say, well, where does that value apply to which parts of the market and how can I deliver it, which I think is a journey I certainly haven't found the end point on, but that's, that's where I've been over the last five years or so. There's a really important lesson in your answer. I, I guess it sums up the difference between working for yourself and for a large organisation, and that is that when you work for yourself, there is this opportunity to experiment. You can have a very clear idea of the vision or the values of what you're trying to achieve and you can test things. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, as you mentioned with your workshops, you, you were able to actually go out in the field and get a sense for what people were interested in. Sometimes that's very hard to do in a large organization. Uh, you're, sort of, you're, you're set on a course and turning everybody and everything around can be very hard. Uh, it sounds like it was uh, a very interesting challenge as you're trying to work your way through that um, so you've you've engaged with the broader finance community you've met this mixed bag of people what did you learn from that in terms of their priorities what were the things that they most wanted your your help with yeah um, I guess I broadly categorize how people try and engage with me in two ways one is is it somebody else's decisions that I'm trying to influence. This, if you like, this is the outward looking lens on the world. Um, and so that might be a financial advisor in, in the case of those people I, I mentioned um, coming to those early sessions saying, well, how do I better engage? How do I better influence my clients? How do I better understand? It's all sort of outward looking about my clients. Not exclusively, but that sort of, that was the majority, I guess, of what I took from those early sessions. Uh, and so that's, that's been one big chunk. And the other stuff I think is more inward looking. So how do I improve my own decisions or the, team, the, the decisions of my team members and my organisation? How do we better form financial forecasts, build better portfolios, 
increase our alpha, all that sort of stuff. And so they're broadly the two categories, um, I guess, where people have sought to engage with my services. So if I look at the first category, so financial advisors there, I think, are, are one fantastic way to apply to this sort of stuff. They've got so many opportunities. You can you can do stuff at scale, online. You've got sort of all the nudges you can put into letters, into emails, onto websites, into sort of robo-advice tools. Plus, you've got all the face-to-face stuff, so all the engaging conversations, getting feedback, all, all that sort of stuff. So I think there's huge amount of opportunity in the case of financial advisors employing this sort of stuff, but challenges, I guess, in deploying it, from my perspective, deploying that at scale. A lot of financial advisors are individual business owners, two or three advisors often. How do I go out and engage with large swathes of them, give them stuff that they value that they can embed in their business? So there's been a challenge in the implementation there, but I think there's there's a rich opportunity for, for advisors to use some of this, this sort of stuff. But also in that space, we've got super funds, for example. Less opportunity for the face-to-face. Quite often, obviously, you know, you don't, you don't know much about y- your clients. You don't see them necessarily. They might just be a name on a spreadsheet or, uh, or you see some uh, member contributions coming in from an employer or something, um, employer contributions. So you don't have as many opportunities for all those sort of rich touch points, for example, but you can do stuff much more at scale. So suddenly if you're sending a letter out to a million people and you start to tweak it in ways that will suggest, well, if we're going to nudge people 5% this way and 10% that way, well, suddenly a 10% nudge of a million people is a lot of people whose decisions you've now influenced. And then in the context of super, of course, if you can influence them and then it has a, a – obviously they don't do much most of the time, but they can have a very long-term impact. So that's the sort of outward-looking view. And then the inward-looking one, it's quite a different audience. So that that might be – analysts and portfolio managers that are listed equities uh, house, for example, or it might be a private equity team or venture capital uh, group or uh, sales side analysts, for example, thinking about how they create their forecasts. And then interestingly, sometimes there's a bit of overlap in the middle. So uh, negotiations is a good one, I think, because that's there's a bit of influencing there. I'm going to need to influence the, the people I'm negotiating with. But there's also a bit of inward looking, how do I manage my own decision-making process through a negotiation? I need to make sure I'm not being influenced by anchors and the strategies the other person's using. I need to think about different perspectives. So that sort of is a, is a crossover point, which again might be venture capital, private equity, or even corporate financial decision-makers, M&A, sort of sitting in that sort of space as well. So before we get on to discussing behavioral finance proper, uh, we were chatting before this podcast and you mentioned that one of the first things you often do with your clients is just to set them straight on what it actually is and isn't. So can you perhaps offer a definition of behavioral finance, clear up some of the misapprehensions? Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't say that I'm, as you say, setting them straight. I mean, I don't like to think that I'm the dictionary for all all things behavioral finance, but I guess I just want to make sure that what they're perceiving to be behavioral finance and what I'm perceiving to be behavioral finance, we're, we're at least aware of our differences, uh, if anything. So I think broadly when people think about behavioural finance, uh, if you go back to those early sessions that I ran, I think people are often thinking about that outward-looking lens. Uh, behavioural finance is about the silly decisions that mum and dads make when they're investing in, in, in shares or building portfolios or thinking about their retirement, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I completely agree that's an important part of behavioural finance in a way that we can add a lot of value if you're a, an advisor or a super fund, for example. But I think much more broadly than that when I look at behavioural finance. So I, I'm thinking more broadly about the psychology of how people are making financial decisions. And so for me, that includes professional investment teams, uh, for example, how they are making them, much more sophisticated, obviously, than, than your mums and dads, but not necessarily optimal, not necessarily... Um, immune from biases and distortions and there's plenty of research around how that works the biases just become more sophisticated don't they uh, and we have more sophisticated ways of, of immunizing ourselves from recognizing them <laughs> i agree <laughs> um, and at that level as well you, you're not only looking at individuals but now you're looking at teams for example which brings in the sort of social psychology of how groups function and organizations and brings in broader concepts of culture and things like that which again i'm not a specialist on on things like culture but that broadly i think we need to look at how t- teams are making effective decisions in, a, in that f- fairly sophisticated context and then it also looks at corporate financial decision making so behavioral corporate finance if you like um, where I'm looking at M&A decisions, capital raising de- decisions, capital allocation decisions within a corporate context. 
And then how do all these things roll up into markets? So do we see distortions in markets? If people underreact to new news, for example, are they uh, influenced by noise? Do, do we see some of the sort of stuff that might affect individual decisions playing out in markets? Can we then develop strategies and build portfolios that might capture some of those sorts of things? Or maybe they offset. Sometimes one bias bumps you up in a direction and the other bias bumps you down. And if some people are distorted up and down, maybe on average it, it they... Um, they offset, or, or maybe there's an arbitrage, but someone's taken advantage of that arbitrage and it's no longer there in the market. So, so I'm broadly, I guess, thinking about all of those different perspectives when I'm talking about behavioral finance. And I guess there's sort of three things that you can look at within those and, and compare them. One, one is a, a, what, I, what I would call a normative approach, which is to say, what is, what is optimal and ideal and a fully rational sort of econ world, if you like. We're all sort of robot decision makers making optimal decisions. All right, it's obviously a make-believe world, but let's let's use that as our starting point. And this is sort of traditional finance, I think. This is where we've come from uh, for years and years before behavioral finance came along. So you've got the, the normative view. Then you've got the descriptive view, which is say, well, how do we describe how people actually make decisions in the real world? And this is where we've got all the psychology and behavioral economics, behavioral finance over the last few decades. And then you've got the third one, which is the prescriptive what should we do? We don't live in that ideal world. We know we've got these biases and distortions. What should we do about it? And that's, I guess, the more bleeding edge behavioral finance. And that's sort of where I'm trying to help my clients. But in many cases, we don't have as much evidence on that third point. So, so that's broadly what I'm thinking when people are saying behavioral finance, but, but obviously it uh, means different things to different people. That's an interesting way to think about it, a normative, descriptive and prescriptive as a generalization, how far apart would you say the normative and the descriptive are? Now, how different is the behavior that we demonstrate versus what would be theoretically optimal? Uh, well, I think it would depend on the context. But to give you one standout example, I guess, where you look at, well, what should we do if we're trying to build a portfolio of equities? So the normative view might be, well, we should use mean variance optimization, for example. We should understand all the, the, the variances and covariances of, a, of, a, um, uh, of our universe of stocks. We should build a portfolio that optimizes risk for a given amount of return or return for a given amount of risk. And yes, there's going to be some quibbling about what measures of risk and vary what time periods and yada, yada, yada. But that's sort of broadly the normative view. And then you've got the descriptive view, which says, well, what do people actually do? And if you go back to Harry Markowitz himself and say, well, how did you build portfolios? He says, well, you know what? I didn't do any of that sort of stuff. I just sort of put 50-50 in bonds and equities or something, right? So there's a massive, massive gap. And, and he should know best, if anybody. All right, so that, then you've got normative and, and descriptive. But then you've got prescriptive, which says, well, we don't live in that world where we know all these covariances and variances. So it's, it's difficult for us to achieve that. Uh, we live in a world where there's too much uncertainty. If we tr even try and measure this sort of stuff, we're not really quite sure what those will be. Um, so what should we do in that world? Well, for example, maybe it's just easier to build a portfolio of equally weighted securities in that case, rebalance every 12 months. Maybe that, that is, and as I said, this is where there's some contention and we don't have as much evidence for the prescriptive view, but it's not go back to the normative because we know that doesn't work. And it's not the, the descriptive because we know that that's, probably too simplistic in many cases, but it's some maybe some halfway house that takes into consideration these weaknesses in our decision making, but the reality of the context in which we're trying to trying to, to build solutions. I think my favorite example of that normative descriptive disconnect, if memory serves, is Paul Samuelson, because he was a big proponent of efficient markets and the markets can't be beat and yet I think he made a lot of money investing in Berkshire Hathaway. <laughs> I think the markets can't be beat except if your name is Warren Buffett. Exactly <laughs> and he was pretty good at uh, at identifying Buffett fairly early on uh, before he became the household name that he is today. So what's the kind of process you use uh, with your clients to help them move from that through through the stages? That sounds like I've got a systematic process, which I think would be overstating <laughs> the, the formality that I apply. But I, I, think, I think broadly the first step that I'm trying to do is to at least raise awareness. So the, the thing that people most engage me for, I guess, is uh, that awareness raising presentation, workshop, discussion, uh, some sort of evidence building session. So actually the, mo the most common thing I do would be bite-sized 
hour, hour and a half, two hour workshops with teams around a specific topic. So for example, it might be dealing with noise as an example. In fact, this is my single most popular workshop topic, uh, dealing with noise. Uh, and so in that session, I will then outline a lot of the research about well, how do we, what do we understand about how people respond in different contexts to noise, finding patterns in the noise, various, various other sort of distortions and biases in that context. And therefore, what does that suggest we should be maybe thinking more about? Now, I don't propose to suggest that I walk in with the right answers because I think it depends on the team, how they function, what their value proposition is, all, their pro all that sort of stuff. But at least it, it's a thought starter to say there are some real problems and opportunities in the way that we do deal with noise, and here is the evidence to say it. We've raised awareness. Now, here are some ideas about what maybe might work for you guys, but really that's a starting point, I think, to then saying, well, what are the steps that we need to take? Do I need a, a checklist to help us? Do I need some to, to install some decision-making weights? Do I need to change the order in which we do stuff? All, all that sort of stuff then follows on. But that's, I guess, as the starting point to then start saying, well, where do we take it depending on the context? And you touched on this topic of noise, which was going to be one of my questions. What is it? How does it affect decision-making? And what are some things people can do to help tune it out? What is it? I mean, I, I guess it's stuff that shouldn't matter broadly, isn't it? It's, it's, it's sort of randomness and sort of stochastic variability, often in the context of actually there's some signal in there as well, but there's a whole lot of other stuff that we really just need to ignore. Uh, and again, it depends on the context as to what proportions you've got of signal and noise. Um, but, but part of it, I guess, is to say, well, can we just work in environments where there's more signal and, and less noise? So that might be saying... Well, the longer the term I look at, the more signal I've got and the less noise, the shorter the term, the reverse. Um, and in some cases you can do that, in some cases you can't, of course. In some cases you can just frame the decision to do that. So um, part of what I'm trying to do with um, professional teams but also with their clients is say, well, actually you can influence decisions just simply by changing the way you frame the information that's going out in the context of the decision that's being made. So one piece of research that I did recently, which was done with um, about 400 or so individual investors, um, and I gave them a, uh, I split them into two groups. I gave them a choice of choosing an asset manager. Uh, one asset manager had um, good long-term returns, but poor short-term returns compared with the other one. And this is the common lament, all right? So you get the asset manager, oh, we've had this short-term underperformance, it's mostly noise. But it's so hard to talk to either the individual investors or the asset consultant or even my institutional investors about why they should ignore this short-term randomness, this noise in this environment. I, I completely hear where they're coming from. So, so I'm not, not saying, again, I'm walking in with, with all the answers to that because there's, there's quite a lot of issues in that. But one of the answers, I think, is just changing the way that you frame that, the information you're presenting. So what I did with the, those 400 individual investors, as I say, broke them into two groups. One of them saw the comparison of returns between these two asset managers in the normal order in which you normally see them across the page. So six months return on the left, followed by 12 months, three years, five years, as you go left to right across the page. Um, and of course, by doing that, you're seeing the short-term underperformance first in the case of the, one, the manager with the, the poor short-term and good long-term. And then for the other 200 investors, that's all in reverse order. Exactly the same information, just the other way around. So they saw the longest term return on the left, followed by, so it might be since inception, three years, five years, three years, one year, six, six months or whatever it was. Same information. What difference did it make? Well, of the 200 investors, it made about a 10% difference in terms of which asset manager they would choose with no difference to the actually underlying information. All that was changed was the order of information that was presented. And it's just leveraging a bit of simple psychology, which says, well, in in Western civilization, I guess we, we typically read left to right. We know that the thing that we see first is going to influence how we then uh, interpret subsequent information if we, if we actually scroll all the way to the left, sorry, all the, right, all the way to the right of the page at all. Um, and so by doing that, we can, in a noisy environment, actually just sort of nudge people towards a better decision, which is to say, well, let's look at the longer term, which, which is less noisy. Your comments remind me of something that I observed uh, very often when I was working institutionally. And I used to sum the idea up with the, the common saying that you are what you eat. And by that, what I meant was you need your diet of research or consumption of the news 
to match the time horizon of your investment process. So if you're saying that you're a long-term investor and you have a long-term horizon, if you create a mismatch between your investment horizon and the, the sorts of information that you're responding to, if you're looking at daily changes and daily information, you become what you eat. And I used to see that play out all the time where there was this mismatch. Um, and it, it creates a tension between your stated goals and what you're working on because you're working on these shorter term things and they just don't fit where you say you're trying to get to. Mm. And I think that's, I think that's a fantastic reflection um, in part because it also reveals that, well, in a fully rational world, if my goals are long term but what I'm consuming is short term, well, I should just be able to ignore it. I wouldn't be influenced by it. I just, I just ignore it. But that's completely counter to what the the research shows, which is you just can't. It's not. It's not like what is it, uh, law and order or something, where you just say let the let, let the record be let that be stricken from the record. <laughs> for example, it doesn't work like that. We're influenced by stuff, and sometimes some of that research shows you're influenced by stuff that's just shown to you for a fraction of a second, and then it goes on to influence your decision beyond your awareness. And so, if you're consuming all that short term stuff, it's you just cannot expect that you can um, ignore it, uh, even if you might choose to or think that you're choosing to. So noise is obviously one thing that affects investment decision-making. Another area uh, with, where people have a lot of questions and a lot of opinions is whether or not decisions should be made individually or as a group or some decisions individually and others as a group. Tell us about uh, the work that you've done with some of your clients on decision-making, both individual and group. Um, yeah, I, I think from memory, this is probably my second most um, popular topic is around group decision making. It's really quite a fun one because you get you can get people involved, you can give them little tasks. So to give you an example, I mean, I, I when I work with a team, say it's got ten people in it, for example, I, I'll often give them a little task where I don't know, I might give them a, a jar of of um, M and M's to to judge how many how many M and M's there are in the jar, and what I'll do is I'll break them into two groups of five, for example, and get them to give me an individual estimate, each person individually. They write on a piece of paper and I collect it all up and then collaborate as a team, come up with their team estimate. And the reason I'm doing it is because I'm trying to demonstrate how some of the, the social psychology of group dynamics apply specifically to them. And I want to do that in part because it's fun, they, they enjoy it. And, and to be honest, I enjoy watching them do it uh, as well. So it's fun for everybody. Um, but also in part because it's very easy, I think, for people to look at the research and say, you know what, that's very interesting, but it doesn't apply to me. Whoever those people were in the study are clearly schmucks. We're much more sophisticated than that. That doesn't work. Uh, that, 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 we don't need to worry about that. I can happily think this is interesting, go back to my day job. So I'm always trying to demonstrate, no, no, this actually works. This actually applies to you. So, so one of the things that I'll do is I'll give them this task, but um, I might throw in an anchor for each of the two groups. So the one group has a low anchor. I've given them a low number to think about before. I've asked them to judge the M&Ms and that uh, the other groups had a high anchor. And then I've collect, I collect up the individual choices. So I'll be writing those up on the, on the whiteboard. And then, I'll, uh, and then they'll be collaborating to go, well, I think it's this. No, I counted up how many M&Ms are on the base and multiplied by how many I think it's high and divided. Anyway, they go through all this process and go back and forth. And, and what it shows, I guess, is that Broadly, the two groups are massively different. So the individual judgments are hugely affected by the anchor uh, for a start, uh, sometimes comically so. They're, they're so far apart, it's, 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 it's almost like they're looking at two different jars of, of NMs to start with. So that's the first point. The second point is that when, I, when you put them in a group, do they overcome the fact that the group, the individuals in their group were biased by the anchor? Put a whole bunch of people together who were biased by an anchor, do they collaborate and go, you know what, we should all bump our numbers up because we're all being affected by this low anchor and, and actually as a collaborating group, we'll be fine. And the answer to that is no, not at all. If the biased group to start with ends up being a biased group after the collaboration. All right, so this, this I, guess, I guess, goes to things like wisdom of crowds, which, yes, can work in some situations, but not if everybody was biased in the same direction in the first place. Um, so I'm looking there for... Did, did you do better than just the average of your members? Did you overcome the bias? Did you know who the expert was in your team? Sometimes there's someone who's very close in your team. Does that person get listened to? Does that person get overrided by the, the most senior person, the, most, the person with the, the loudest voice? Or sometimes they're just an outlier and everyone goes, well, ignore this person. Clearly the rest of us know what we're talking about. That guy over there's got no idea. You go, well, actually, either that person sometimes is the closest 
or they're on the other side of the answer to the, the rest of the group. So actually including them in the collaboration w- would have helped the team come to a more accurate answer. So it, that sort of individual uh, and group dynamic exercise just unpicks so many different topics that you can then go and explore. How do you know who's got expertise? How do you weight expertise? What are the processes that you use for combining the views of different people? All sorts of stuff around cognitive diversity, the team processes, cascades, information cascades, that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to guess that a typical board meeting environment is probably one of the worst mechanisms for aggregating different viewpoints because you typically have inconsistency in terms of people's participation. Uh, I've seen this many times in any board. You always have a few people that do a lot of talking, a few that don't do very much. Uh, The first person to talk sets the anchor. It's very hard for anybody else to disagree after that person's advanced an idea one way or the other. So in, in many ways, the the governance setups that we rely on very heavily embed a lot of these problems in the way that they work. Yeah, and, and I'm not, I guess, suggesting that always equal contributions should be ideal, although there is a, a broad study that showed that that's a good measure of how effective a, a group is. Um, but in the absence of being able to identify where expertise lies, which we're just not nearly as good enough, uh, as good at as we think, then we're more likely to be railroaded, as you say, by the person who speaks first, the extrovert, the person who's best at jumping into a conversation um, when there's a break in the conversation. It's, it's um, influenced by people who are more likely to interrupt. So this is where some of the gender stuff comes in as well because women tend to be more interrupted in conversation, so then they have less opportunity to contribute, which sort of sounds like it's a bad thing for men, but women are often doing the interrupting as well, so it's not necessarily uh, all, all um, the problem of, of men. But one of the concepts that comes back from what's the role of women, for example, in, in group decision-making is that actually in groups with more more women in them, there, are, there, there in many cases is uh, more equal turn-taking in a, in a decision-making process, and more equal turn-taking tends to be associated with better decision-making in itself. So it's, it's this sort of unpicking some of our presumptions about group decision making. Yeah, gender diversity might be good, but actually it might be an indirect way of getting better contributions from the group and better collaboration than uh, just putting women in who maybe think the same as the men anyway. Uh, we need to sort of look through some of the, the precon- preconceptions there, I think. Otherwise, we could always try the, the technique used by the ancient Germanic tribes. So they, if they had an important decision, they would ha- hold two meetings, one sober and the next day they'd hold one drunk and then they'd add the, the decisions together because the idea was they were being rational on the sober day but they're more likely to be truthful on the drunk day and they wanted to get both sides of the debate. Well, not, not that I'm going to advocate doing it while you're drunk but, but I, think, I think that actually does link to, if you like, the wisdom within, this, this idea that it's a bit like having... The, diverse, the benefit of diversity of having two people with different views and you collaborate or you even average them and you get a, a, a view that's, that's somewhere intermediate but more accurate on average. Well, you can apply that same sort of concept as, as an individual and just say, I'll make a decision today and then I'll sleep on it, make a decision tomorrow or next week. And then if, I've, if the second time I've made a decision, I've assumed that the first one was wrong and I've had another crack at it. Well, those two decisions, if I average them, tend to be more accurate than either of the two decisions uh, individually but for that to work you've got to be honest though so if you rewrite history if you change the decision that you made last week or the day before which often happens then that doesn't work if i change it so what would well it? what i mean is if you say you, you take a decision today and then a week later you revisit that decision but if you revise history if you change in your mind the the context and the story behind that decision then you're not necessarily keeping yourself accountable or averaging the two decisions. I think that's where it's helpful to use things like uh, a journal or some kind of record to actually show what you were thinking at the time in the context because afterwards it's very easy to revise it yeah. or to change the emphasis. It, oh, I completely agree in terms of using decision journals. In the case of having two cracks at a decision, so it might be I've decided to buy BHP, for example. Well... I've decided on Monday, but let me not execute until I have another look at it on Wednesday. And then having made two judgments at it, do I still think it's right? 
I think the part of the benefit of that is that because some of the contextual cues are somewhat ephemeral, so well, I was having a bad day on Monday, the market was down that day, I was hungry because I hadn't had my lunch, I hadn't had a bad sleep, the kids are up in the night time, whatever it was. Well, by Wednesday, a lot of those things have gone away. So if I'm distorted by that sort of stuff, well, those sort of cute, even if everything else is the same, at least I've taken some of that distortion out of my decision and, and maybe that's, maybe I come to the same conclusion. It's not to say I, I should differ, but I've at least given myself an opportunity to get outside of those, some of those contextual distortions. It's interesting you mentioned contextual distortions as that reminds me of some of the, the work that I've seen uh, online from professional traders. So these are people that are trading their own book, um, often day trading. Most people give day trading a bad name, but leaving that aside, many of these traders approach the job of trading very much like a performance athlete. And they often begin by trying to figure out what that contextual baseline is. So how are they feeling? Did they have enough sleep? Did they have something happen in their personal life? Because they've learned in many cases through bitter experience, that's going to change their perception of risk and it's going to change the way they do their job. And so they want to set that baseline early because they may want to change what they do during the day to offset some of these contextual factors. And I think that's very interesting that they've, as I said, you can have your views on uh, day trading, whether it's right or wrong, but I think they've evolved, uh, some of them have evolved a higher level of self-awareness in that they're explicitly taking these sorts of factors into account every day before they start trading. Yeah. Well, even if you're not a day trader, I think you can use some of the same sort of concepts though. I mean, if you look at what professional athletes do in terms of all the feedback they're getting, all the coaching and support they're getting, because they're, for them, a very small increment, incremental improvement in their performance, if I'm Roger Federer and I go from the quarterfinals to the semifinals or from the semifinals to the to the, to the final, to winning the final, each of those increments is very, very important for prize money and everything else. And so if you think, well, are my decisions, if I'm a, an asset manager managing a billion dollars or $10 billion or something, well, actually, small increments in my decision-making make a big difference as well. So I, I'd be looking at the same sort of model in the context of long-term investing as well to think, well, how can I improve? How can I get feedback? How can I be more aware of some of those sort of contextual issues? And if it's a, I don't know, if it's, a, if it's an all-day board meeting, for example, geez, you don't want to be making important decisions at the end of that if people are tired and hungry for example and they've already made a whole bunch of important decisions along the way I guess that's the sort of stuff where you think that's just not an ideal decision making environment in that case I used to always get annoyed when I'd see the board meeting scheduled after the audit and risk meeting because <laughs> I'd think after four hours of compliance your, your brain is just fried for anything in terms of long term decision making well it depends what you want to what to, you want to happen in that meeting if you just want people to tick a box and keep going if you want to sneak something in that the board's not going to notice ideal <laughs> it's funny you say that i know somebody at, at a at a super fund that he found that uh, the more difficult papers if they were at the end of the agenda people would literally just um would would just not rubber stamp it but that the discussion was totally different compared to having them at the beginning of the agenda. Yeah, I think you're more likely to find decision-making shortcuts. And if those shortcuts are do nothing, do the default, for example, which are probably the, the two big ones in the context of dealing with complexity, if, if those things actually are the ideal answer, then fine, I guess. I mean, this, this is why that sort of prescriptive view isn't necessarily the normative view, because sometimes the, the nudge and the right answer, the, those simple heuristics actually can, can help you get to the right answer. But I wouldn't want to rely on that necessarily <laughs> for, for all types of decisions in all circumstances. The, the other heuristic I used to see all the time was, can you go back and do more work on this? Uh, which is fine because many times ideas you know, evolve and they need to develop. But there was no, often no follow-up in terms of, well, right, what is the work that you need to see to make a decision? What is missing now that you'd like more information on? It was almost just a, as a, as you say, as a heuristic to sort of bat it back. But there's a, there's a lot of research on this. I'm sure you would have seen the study about uh, parole applications in the time of day. Yeah, that, that, that has had some criticism, that particular study. I mean, it's just so dramatic what, what came out of that particular study, and I've seen it repeated all over the place. But I do take that one with a bit of grain of salt. Uh, but I agree with the broad principles underlying it, which is that, yeah, tiredness, you, you, fa you fatigue your level of hunger or sort of glucose, for example, whether you've had excess, all those sorts of things are actually important. 
um, to whether you, you're going to notice stuff, whether you're going to be subject to biases. I mean, often you, you just it's just effortful, conscious sort of awareness you need to employ to overcome a decision-making bias. And you're just less likely to do it if you're tired and hungry, uh, for example, than if, you, if you're well-rested. So I'd, I'd like to talk to you now about your latest book, Cyborg. And as the name suggests, we're talking about quantitative technology and humans. Tell us about the idea behind the book and what you were hoping to explore. So I guess from my perspective, the um, genesis of it was that I'm typically working with people who are employing human judgment, sort of qualitative um, uh, judgment analysts, for example, in an asset management team, rather than the quant side. And one of the things that I often talk about is, well, we just need to get better feedback to understand how we can improve our decision making, which means quantifying some things. Let's go back and look at our forecast, quantify sort of confidence intervals if we can, find distortions where we're not sufficiently accounting for reversion to the mean, that sort of stuff. Um, and so there's a bunch of things that are, if you like, quantitative supports that can enhance human decision making, human judgment. So. What the book was is taking that and saying, that's one way that you can combine humans, human judgment and machines or quantitative processes to improve overall outcomes. So that's, if you like, taking qual and adding a bit of quant, but there's also other models. So I, I well, I'm a bit of a fan of the science fiction uh, genre and I've used a few of those models in, in, the, in the case of that book. So that particular model I've called the Iron Man model because the Iron Man character was a human being, but he was enhanced by all this weapon systems and armor and computer generated god knows what um, and so that's the model for let's take humans and support them with a bit, bit of quant and, and analytics around human judgment essentially it's a human judgment process still but just supported versus uh, what I call the Terminator model which was based on the Terminator movies you've got that Arnold Schwarzenegger character who is a robot underneath he is just a robot but if he was just a robot he would be identified as such very easily he's supposed to be an infiltration unit going off and killing people and you'd be able to identify no he's look he's a metal thing walking down the street that doesn't look right so what they've done is they've enhanced him by putting a layer of human flesh on the top of him so he could walk into a police station um, without being noticed immediately so that's the second model which is saying can we take the quantitative sort of side of things sort of big data analytics and add a bit of human insight to it and then enhance it uh, get better than it would have been just with the quant by itself. So they're broadly the two models. And, uh, and what the book is saying um, generally is that these are ideals and yes, there are ways that we can do these two things much better. And yes, there's a lot of sense in combining, creating these sort of cyborgs. But the evidence to date is that we're actually pretty poor at it. So that when we combine, we take often a simple algorithm, we add a bit of extra e expert human judgment to it, and the algorithm plus the expert does worse than just letting the algorithm go by itself, uh, for example. So th that sort of is teasing out, well, what can we do to overcome some of these problems and how can we sort of nudge ourselves towards these sort of more optimal ideal outcomes? I read a paper a few years back on this topic and it had, it had an interesting idea, which was humans are good at noticing change, which algorithms are not as good at algorithms are very good at integrating different variables because they do so consistently so they're they're not as biased and their evaluations aren't as subject to outside influence so what this paper was arguing is get the humans to study the variables because they'll notice the change in the variables but use an algorithm to integrate the variables to me that sounded like a fairly sensible approach. Is that the sort of thing that you're working on? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that connects very well. I mean, it also goes back to that dealing with noise one um, topic we talked about earlier. So one example I talk about there is when you're dealing with noise, we are, we're in an environment where we're more likely to see change anyway. Y yes, I agree with you that we're, we're um, more likely to perceive it once it's, it reaches us, but it's actually more likely to reach us in the first place. So as an example, you never see a, a news headline that says, here are all the important things that stayed the same today, uh, for example. It's all about change. But then also another example is where you see those pictures of the African savannah and, it say, and they say, Spot the, can you find the leopard? Where's the leopard in here? 
and you search and you search and you search. Well, if you're like me, you search and you search and you can't find this thing and you, and you start thinking, there is no leopard here. They've just given me a picture of some grassland and this, what are they trying to do? And then they hit play and you see the leopard move. And as soon as the leopard moves, you go, oh, how could I possibly miss it? There it is right there. Uh, and it's, and it's, it's our sensitivity to the move and the change that's allowed us to spot it in a, in a second as soon as, it, as soon as that's happened. So I completely agree with you. We're predisposed to see changes. But again, I, mean, I agree as well on the, on the quant side that it's, it's the consistency of application um, that is its strength. And what's happened, I guess, in some of those um, expert plus algorithm scenarios is that whilst, as you say, the expert's better at noticing the change, what they sometimes do is to overcorrect for it, I guess. That, that's the challenge, knowing how far you can rely on human, ju human judgment. And we tend to be a bit too overconfident to think, well, actually, you know what, if the algorithm doesn't really understand that, this time is different. Well, actually, no, it's con the consistent application is more powerful than we might expect. And yes, sometimes we do need to change it, but perhaps not as often as the human judge might think. So in, in terms of your work with this idea of integrating uh, quantitative tools and human decision making, what would you say is the most common mix of the two? I think the most common mix is no mix at all, or sorry, that's, that's an exaggeration, is not enough mix. So walking into a group and finding the qual people who are quite averse to quantitative stuff, uh, often quite disparaging to, to, to it, uh, for example, and then walking into the quant side and finding the exact opposite message. So it's all uh, a bit airy-fairy and we, we, we know what we're doing, we've got the data and, and we'll crunch it and tell you tell the answer. So not to say that there isn't people in intermediate ground, of course, but it, it just doesn't seem like it's a natural hybrid and it takes a bit of effort to get in there when people are coming from the two quite uh, distinct uh, perspectives. Could, could that be a personality thing? And I say this purely anecdotally, but when I think of the people that I know that are predominantly quantitative in the way they invest versus the people that I know that are predominantly qualitative, Again, small sample, anecdotal. But I observe in those two groups what I think are some fairly different personality traits. Could it be that you're drawn to the approach that suits your personality and the way you think? And maybe that's why there's not so much crossover because you're kind of not just trying to mesh two approaches but different personality types as well. Yeah, and it might be more than personality. It might be your skill sets after you come out of university and get put in the quant team maybe, and then you develop a whole bunch of skills and practices and, 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 and knowledge of the quant processes and you go further and further away from qual in one direction and similarly for the quant, for the qual people going further and further in their direction. Um, but it's uh, interesting, I think, as you go back to, I think negotiations is one of the topics where, which combines some of these aspects together. And one of the things that comes out of negotiations research is we just don't take enough of other people's perspectives into account. So in the context of negotiation, I need to understand where the other party is coming from and, and we can then find the sort of in, what they call integrative solutions or sort of synergistic win-win type scenarios. And actually similarly in group decision making as well, for me to understand and to incorporate diverse views into my decision making, I need to understand what those diverse views and perspectives are. And, and we're just not uh, as good at that as we should be or, or, or potentially need to be to optimise those sorts of, of um, decisions in those sorts of contexts. So, so I would look at that as, as, a, as an example, and there's a good test of it, um, which I've seen reported various places. Uh, James Montier comes, comes to mind, but I think it's, it's been in newspapers as well, which you might have seen as well, where you ask people, you ask a whole bunch of people in, individually to say, well, can you pick a number between zero and 100? You seen this one? And you, I've seen Richard Thaler do some work with this, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's been in a few places. Yeah. yeah. So can you pick a number between zero and a hundred, and there'll be a prize for, for the person who is closest to picking two thirds of the average of everybody's answers. And so, in fact, I used this the other day with with a group to see what what they thought. But the the idea is, well, maybe if everybody picked randomly, then the average would be fifty. If I wanted two thirds of fifty, then I'd go to thirty three. But then you go, well, wait a minute, if everybody else went 33, then I should go two-thirds of 33, which is 22. But then wait a minute, if everybody went 22, I should go two-thirds of 22, which is, what, 14 or something. And you, you can continue this process ad infinitum until you get all the way down to zero. So the logical outcome is, is zero if everybody was completely rational. 
Um, but we're not all completely rational. So it requires you to take the perspective of other people to see, to think, how many steps do they take in this process? Yeah, at what point do they give up? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and some people don't take the process at all. So you see people going for 50 or 33 or some other numbers. I think they even got a few people saying 100. Which <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> yeah, I think they're confused by the question, I think. <laughs> Highest wins, maybe. Um, but And I think the James Montier one that I, I recall seeing, you could sort of see, well, there's peaks around 33 and 22 and 14 or whatever the numbers were. So you can sort of see how many people have taken two or three or four steps in the process and how many people have taken all the way down to zero. And there's a spike at zero as well but it requires that um, perspective take in and, and we, we tend to take one or two steps but not three or four or the infinite answer sufficiently not, not that the infinite answer here is right because that would require everybody to be fully rational and so you'd want to come back from that a bit but we're just not taking enough of a perspective of what other people are thinking i think from memory in the version that i saw which was i'm getting the details right it was run in the financial times mm -hmm. newspaper so they collected a lot of responses from the paper's readers. I think the winning number ended up being 11, or somewhere around 11, 11 to 14 in that in that range was the, um, so what's that, four steps? Something like that. I think the one I saw was Montier, which I think it was in the low teens as well, or something, something like that. So it was, maybe it was mid, I can't remember anyway, but it was, yeah, maybe three or four steps, yeah. It's, it's an interesting experiment because it relates back to, uh, Kane's comments about the market work, the stock market working like a beauty contest, where you're not actually trying to pick uh, objectively the most beautiful person, but you're trying to pick the person that everybody else thinks mm. is the most beautiful person, which yeah. is kind of how the experiment works. But also, I think it links back to when you think about those perspectives about, well, it's about individuals, it's about professional investment teams, it's about corporates, but ultimately, it's also about how it influence the, influences the market. So if you're going to use this sort of these sorts of insights, well, you want to make sure your decision making is is refined and you're not biased and distorted and making a whole bunch of silly choices. But, but to make money, you also need to understand the decisions made by others in the market. So you really need to be right when others are wrong. So you've been quite busy on the writing front lately. You've um, written an interesting article that that looks at the royal commission into banking and finance here in australia and a lot of bad stories have come up as a result of the commission where it's revealed different uh, large firms doing things and one of the things that i thought was very interesting in the article that you wrote is you related some of these events back to behavioral problems you use them as examples of uh, of some of the things we've been chatting about perhaps you can tell us about your article and some of the things that you've been noticing as this royal commission's been going on um well i think the broad theme from my perspective has been that we shouldn't expect there to be bad apples or if there are bad apples they are the minority so there's not a whole lot, bunch of bernie madoffs out there sort of deliberately trying to rip people off uh, more it is a bad barrel if you like which is infecting the, the apples, the decisions made it, which which goes back to all this contextual dependence of decision making. So that's that's broadly the theme, and and the couple of articles um, that I've written uh, have been reflecting that. And one, for example, was about conflicts of interest. So there was a great paper that was put out as part of the Royal Commission um, process only a couple of weeks ago, looking at some of the research behind well, what do we know about conflicts of interest and how do they influence people's uh, decisions, and. Some of that research, again, links quite nicely with the, with broader psychology research, which says well, actually the, the impact of conflicts of interest often happen beyond our awareness and often more powerful than what we expect. So if you give someone, put someone in a position where they have a, a conflict of interest, we shouldn't expect them, even if they put their hand on their heart and tell us, and even if genuinely they are trying to avoid the conflict, we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't expect them to be able to avoid it. Um, because there's, there's just stuff that will happen beyond their awareness. Behind. Well, it's anchoring them, isn't it, in one way? Well, because they can't unknow what they know about <laughs> the other side of the... Yeah, it'd be interesting, wouldn't it? If you put, set someone up with a conflict of interest but they weren't aware of the conflict of interest, yeah, you'd, you'd think they wouldn't, they wouldn't be influenced in that sort of situation. Um, th so there's conflicts of interest which, again, sort of show that there's more going on behind the scenes. If you peel the veil of the, of the, of the conscious awareness... We're more conflicted or we're more impacted than we think, even if we claim that we can overcome it. And then some of the rational approaches just don't work very well. So if you disclose to people and say, uh, dear client, did you know your advisor has a conflict of interest? 
well, from a fully rational world, you might think, well, the, the client in that case will go, actually, I can discount the value of the advice I've received from my advisor now because I realize it's conflicted. But that disclosure doesn't work because the client is in a very poor position to work out what the impact of, of the conflict is, how much should I discount, how much has the, the advisor's advice been, uh, been impacted. Uh, is it uh, acceptable for me to reject the advice? There's some some some, uh, in, in some psychological sort of interaction going on between the client and the advisor. Uh, so disclosure doesn't work. Sanctions really are, are, are poor because it's very difficult to 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 judge when stuff has been conflicted and, and um, uh, impose penalties. And so it's sort of left there with things like we just need to remove the conflict if we can. But in many cases, again, in the real world, even if you remove conflicts where there's a commission, for example, which is clearly conflicted. Well, in many other cases, you're still left with another conflict, which is, you know, what I have to uh, convince my client that my service is valuable. The way I convince them it's valuable might not actually connect with me providing a valuable service, for example, because the client's judging my value on different metrics to me actually delivering the value, uh, as an example. Or even where biases and conflicts actually help. So if an advisor is incented to help a client to take out insurance because you know what they've got a dependent family and if they lost their job then there'd be significant hardship well does it really matter if the advisor then is incented to deliver that insurance because actually it's ended up in a better outcome for the client and maybe that wouldn't have happened if there wasn't that incentive around so that that's i guess opens the door to a whole bunch of possible behavioral solutions about again the order of information do you prompt people here do you change the way things are framed over there in addition to removing some of the conflicts behind the scenes. So that was one perspective on it. I guess the other thing is just looking at how decision-making works in a large organisation like some of the major banks that we were talking about beyond mere conflicts of interest. And that goes back to things like the team decision-making, group decision-making. And I think there's rightly a focus on group decision-making in a board context, as, a, as, you, as you pointed out, because that's, that's obvious, obviously the pinnacle of the organisation. But the same principles really apply to the senior exec team and all the way down through the organisation. Whenever there's group decision-making processes taking place, these aren't just sort of theoretical, it's nice to have diverse groups and, yes, we should try and do this and try and do that. Actually, what it does is it means that there are systematic distortions that lead to bad outcomes for organisations and bad outcomes for clients. So I guess in my article, I was trying to say, well, if we looked through the organization's decision-making process, particularly around groups, and applied some of the principles, so around transparency of decision-making processes, about incorporating diverse views, about using some of these techniques and ideas of behind the wisdom of crowds, for example, then you're going to get better accountability, you're going to get better buy-in, for example, you're going to get less distortion where things have been overlooked. Um, and so that, that was really the connection point I was trying to draw. Do you think that having skin in the game would make a difference because there's a lot of people in the finance industry uh, managing other people's money uh, and aside from whether or not they get a bonus they're not necessarily connected to their clients when something goes wrong you know they don't necessarily as we've discovered uh, through this royal commission they don't necessarily lose their job or the company doesn't necessarily get shut down by the regulator do you think part of the problem is that there's a lack of skin in the game and if there was more skin in the game, it would change the incentive structures? Well, I think it necessarily would, wouldn't it? If you've got skin in the game, then you've got incentive to maintain an outcome which is in your best interest, which is also hopefully in your client's best interest if you've got skin in the same game that they that they do, which I, I presume is where you're going. Yes. Yes. So, so I agree. I, mean, I think incentives are a big driver and that's what the research shows. It is important to get the incentive structure right. But beyond that, there's also a bunch of other things. Like, for example, I've got an incentive if I'm in a team uh, to not look stupid in front of my team. Even if my financial incentive is aligned and I, I, I I just don't want to appear stupid in front of them. I don't want to feel stupid. Uh, so in that case, even if I've got an incentive to act financially in my interest, I've also got an incentive to not necessarily raise something in a meeting that might make me look stupid if I ask a question that I think everybody knows the answer to but me, for example. So that's, that's I guess, where you, you might want to say, yes, let's get the incentives aligned, but let's also then have a process that allows for disconfirming information to, to be facilitated coming to the fore with maybe devil's advocacies or having um, uh, secret ballots or a bunch of different mechanisms because those sort of psychological incentives actually can remain quite quite hidden if you're not careful. Are you seeing these sorts of techniques get adopted? 
Good question. So I've I'm not sure because I've I've just guess, I guess I've got my anecdotal evidence for the people that I I see who in some cases are using it, in some cases aren't. Um, I've just designed a survey, which maybe we can link to, I, I don't know, on your, on your podcast. Sure, we can add it to the podcast notes. Yeah, that'd be great. So I, I've designed a survey that actually asks that question. So in part, it's asking around some of the, the, the do you feel that you, your decisions are incorporated effectively in decisions? So it's asking a bit about the dynamics behind decisions, decision-making in people's teams. But then it goes on to say, and which of these strategies, which of these approaches do you use? Do you use devil's advocates or secret ballots and all those sorts of things. So I haven't seen that sort of systematic review across the investment landscape or super funds or asset managers um, per se, which is why in part I've put this survey together to get a bit of a benchmark. What are people using? What are people finding effective? Um, so hopefully that survey will tell us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like a great initiative. So talking a bit further about some of the things you've been writing, another great article was this uh, article that you published recently on eight gaps in the way uh, people make decisions and use behavioral finance. So I'm guessing this is a collection of some of the things that you've learned in working with your clients. Perhaps you can take us through some of the gaps. Yeah, so this is in particular is looking, I guess, at the use in a professional investment context um, rather than individual. So the, the eight things one is thinking it's not about me. So this goes back again to the issue. It's it's very easy to say, no, those studies are other people. This, uh, this we're exploiting me. everybody else's biases. Yeah, that's we don't right. have any of it. Right? We're, we're perfect. Um, I think that's called the blind spot bias. I think that one, that we, it's just a natural thing. Um, and I'm sure I'm as much um, affected by it as others. So I don't want to be critical of people for having that view. That's just naturally how they uh, often respond to this sort of stuff. And I think it's that's my challenge to help break that barrier. I, th I think my favorite bias related to that is the um, the fundamental attribution error. So when somebody else changes their mind, oh, he's being irrational and inconsistent. And they don't know anything about the topic. And when you change your mind, oh, well, I had to respond to the circumstances. That That is one of the things that I actually remember sitting in my psychology back in the early 90s and learning about these those fundamental attribution errors and some of the other similar ones. And I still use that all the way to, through today. I mean, that's one example I like as well is when someone goes through a red light. If I go through a red light, well, you know what? The sun was in my eyes. I couldn't see it. The kids were screaming in the back. Yeah, I was in a, whatever it was. Someone else goes in a red through a red light. Crazy hoon. <laughs> what are they thinking? Right? They should be off the road. Um, and you see that all over the place. So I completely agree. Um, so going through the list, thinking it's not about me would be one. Uh, number two, uh, inconsistent knowledge. So th this this to me is when I walk into a team, often there's someone who is really all over behavioral finance and decision making. They've read all the books, uh, really is deeply ingrained in the way they think about the world, but often they're an island. So the other people on the team, well, they haven't read all those books. They might know a little piece here, a little piece there. And it's hard for that person who's the island to then say, well, we need to get everybody to do this. And they're going, well, why should we? There's nothing wrong with the way we're doing things now. So I think that's a real challenge where you've got that one sort of thought leader. And that's, I guess, partly the role that I can play is that that person can go and point to me and go, it's not me now you need to listen to. Look, somebody else is saying the same thing. <laughs> um, so that's uh, that's another, another challenge within the team context. Uh, the third thing is thinking knowledge is an effective vaccine against biases. So as I said at the outset, I think knowledge is the starting point, but certainly not the ending point. And, and telling people about bias just does not work. In fact, I had one session with a whole bunch of um, asset consultants. They were not that I want to stick the knife into asset consultants again, but um, I had about 40 of them in a room, gave them that sort of anchoring type exercise. And I said, oh, how many people here are aware that I've given you an anchor that I was trying to influence your decision? And bear in mind, they're all at the behavioral finance workshop. So they probably think the game is up here anyway, that I'm trying to do something. Every single hand in the room went up, right? Every single person realized or, or claimed that they realized that I was using anchor. And I thought, holy smoke, this is going to be interesting. Is my anchoring exercise here going to work or am I going to be confounded by all these people who are on to my game? Anyway, I didn't need to be worried. It was still like a 50% anchoring index, a massive difference between the people who'd seen the high and the low anchor. So despite their knowledge, it made almost no difference or no difference at all, no discernible difference anyway um, in terms of how they, um, how they responded. So knowledge is not enough. You need to start thinking more about processes and feedback and checklists and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that, that's where the next step has to be. Um, the fourth one is ignoring context and interrelatedness. So this is the idea, I guess, that someone says, yes, I'm aware of overconfidence and it does X and it does Y and we've stopped it by doing Z. 
yes, that's interesting, but actually there's also a thing called loss aversion, and loss aversion sometimes is the opposite to overconfidence, or at least it's manifest in that way, even if the underlying psychology is a bit different. And so if you've counted one bias without thinking about another thing that sort of interrelates and thinking about which might be more powerful in the context and how does it affect each person and what the consequences are, fixing one thing might actually make things worse. So we need to understand those sort of things, how they relate to each other. Um, the fifth one is not looking beyond, beyond the individual, because a lot of the, re the research, the biases and heuristics research is, is about individual judgment, whereas we need to understand it in the context of teams and groups working together, and there's a lot of other stuff that goes on in that environment that we've touched on already. Uh, number six is a lack of measurement. So this is going back to the point about quals and quants, about the, 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 the quals, if they're creating financial forecasts, for example, well, are, are we capturing those forecasts and analyzing them, thinking about confidence intervals and that sort of stuff? If we haven't done that, it can be too comfortable for us to assume that our forecasts are okay without going to check for some of the distortions. You become a bit like the fishermen. They remember all the, the big fish they catch and conveniently forget the days they come home with an empty bucket. Yeah, I think that's that's probably a good analogy, I think. Um, yeah, and there's a whole bunch of hindsight sort of biases and distortions that, that happen in our memory. And again, often beyond our awareness. So th th these aren't people who are deliberately coming home and saying, you know what, I caught a massive fish today and I've never caught a small one. Uh, that's genuinely what they remember. Um, and this goes back to the work of Tetlock, for example, which I see you've got a Tetlock book on your bookshelf here. Um, but that, that's the sort of stuff where people have said, well, um, can I predict whether the Berlin Wall will fall? No, I don't think it will. And then Tetlock comes back 10 years later and says, oh, you got that one wrong, didn't you? And, and the person says, no, I didn't. I, I got that right. You, your records clearly are wrong, <laughs> for example. Um, I, to be honest, I, I, I um, trust Tetlock more than I do his, uh, his forecasters and those sort of things. Uh, number seven is not optimizing humans and machines, which goes back to that point about sort of cyborgs and how we don't quite manage to combine them in ways that actually are enhancing in many ways. Uh, and then finally, eight is in the context of asset managers, not tailoring the way that they communicate to their clients. So I, I, it's, I think when I go into asset management teams, I'm not talking to their marketing team. I'm talking to their analysts and portfolio managers, and, uh, for example, and they're not marketing and client engagement people per se. In fact, some of them don't really like having to go out and give presentations to people at all. They want rather me actually looking at the, uh, at the analytics and, and building portfolios. So thinking about, well, how does this then go into the PowerPoint presentations? How do I communicate this sort of stuff? What, like the, the, the order of returns and the way that I, 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 I pitch to link into the decision-making biases of my audience and understand their perspective, that sort of stuff, which in the context of a financial advisor, they're all over it. That's what they're thinking about day in, day out. In the context of an asset management team, not so much. It's not really their, uh, the, the way they're thinking about the world. Even in terms of, again, this idea of the information that they're consuming. So I'm, I'm thinking of a, a fund manager that I know that showed me their portfolio management model that they'd built in Excel. And literally the two tabs that were next to each other, one was a tab of the portfolio and the other was a tab of performance attribution in the same workbook next to each other and I remember having a conversation with this fund manager sort of trying to understand why they would do that because the temptation during the day to just look at that performance attribution hourly mm -hmm. or, or perhaps even more the, the pull to do that is just going to be so strong and you they're literally eating noise by doing that because then every time they open that tab, um, they're not. That's time that they're not spending thinking about a decision that can improve a portfolio outcome. And when I had this conversation uh, with this fund manager, they sort of they didn't have a good answer for why the two tabs were next to each other. And they said, "You're, you're probably right. If we take it out, um, then just by that simple nudge, we're probably going to spend more time focusing on the things that that matter." Yeah, so, so two things occur to me listening to that example. Uh, one is that the same thing happens to me. So, so when I'm, I'm looking at the stock market, I mean, geez, I look at it every day. Oh, I do, uh, many times yeah. in the day. <laughs> yeah. I, actually, I'll tell you a really good story about this. So I, I had the opportunity to meet uh, John Kay. So John Kay uh, was, um, He's written, he's written several books. He's an academic, he's a practitioner, and he was selected by the UK government to review the equity market a couple of years back. And he authored the K Report, which similar to 
to a, a royal commission, but more of a, an inquiry. And then he wrote a very good book called Other People's Money, which is his expanded book on the ideas that he found in his review of the equity market. And it's all about the need to be long-term and focused on on the long term and how we, we're very short term. And he came to Australia and he was at a lunch talking about the book. And I asked him after the lunch, I said, just between you and me, well, now it's not between you and me, but I, I don't think you'll mind. You mentioned being long term, but how often do you look at Amazon to see your author's sales numbers for your new book? And he laughed. He said several times a day. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> He right. couldn't help himself. Yeah, yeah. We're all like that. But I think you've got to recognize that we're all like that. And so then what can you do about it? So in your case, you're saying, can you separate the tabs? In my case, one of the things that I tried to do was to say, can I insert a small friction into my decision-making process so that, yes, if I'm looking at stuff, can I make it slightly harder for me to do something about it so I'm less likely to act on the noise? So one of the things I used to do is to have my trading password was a jumble of letters and numbers that was stuck in a spreadsheet somewhere that it was never very easy to find. So if I wanted to go trading, yes, I could. I could go hunting for my the, the, through the spreadsheet to try and find my password and type it in. But it's sort of making it harder and harder, making it less likely to happen. It'd give me more time to reflect before I actually go and hit the buy or the sell, the, the sell button in that case. That's, that's very good advice. But that's an individual. I think the other thing that can happen in a team environment is you just need somebody to help keep you accountable in that case. It's very hard to do it yourself. Much easier to see other people's biases and, and distortions and their judgments. So this is where I think teams need to think about the coaching and support and feedback and do they have mechanisms to keep people to account, to, to have coaching. All that sort of stuff I think needs to or could be a real benefit of a group context compared to individuals who have to really often do this stuff by themselves or maybe they're an advisor if they do. But you've got to trust your team for that to happen because you're you're making yourself vulnerable by doing that. If you're saying to somebody, hold me accountable for my decisions, point out when you think I'm making a mistake, you've got to trust that they're not going to use that as a weapon against you. So to the extent that there's office politics in an organisation, it makes it very hard to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. But that's maybe where you can have an external, you can have an external advisor to a board, for example, external consultants. People can come in who don't. Well, I guess there's always, there's different issues in having external people to come into your organisation around confidentiality or, or whatever it is. But I agree, But that's, which is not to say there's not solutions. We just need to think about how we put those things together. Okay, so wrapping up our conversation, if listeners are wanting to find out more about behavioral finance they can read your first book which is an excellent primer on some of the key ideas what are some other resources that you'd recommend for people whether they be books or podcasts or other things on the web to learn more about behavioral finance um, so, so the intention of my book, I guess, is to talk about the applications of behavioral finance. Um, so that in a professional context, professional investment context. Um, so that's for that audience in that sort of particular niche. If, if I was to look at more broadly, I'd say if you want to get the psychology, not behavioral finance, but some of the underlying psychology, I mean, I'd go back to things like thinking fast and slow. I, I always ask people when I run, run workshops, how many people have read thinking fast and slow? And normally a couple of hands go up. Uh, and then and I, you've read all of it. <laughs> that's exactly book. right. And, and that's often my second question. And then another couple of hands go up in terms of how many people have not read all of it, but have read half of it, for example. So that there is, it can be a bit of a drain to get through the whole theme. But even if you get through half of it, I think it's it's well worth reading half of it. Um, so I'd recommend that for the from the psychology perspective, but it's not finance. In fact, Daniel Kahneman would, would scrap the whole finance investment industry if he had a chance, I'm sure. I often wonder, thinking about him when it comes to bias, is he seems to be, me, to be biased to the negative. And from what I heard, his research partner, Amos Tversky, was biased to the positive. Uh, unfortunately, Amos Tversky is no longer with us. But when you when you hear Kahneman speak, he seems to have a very, you know, almost um, nihilistic bias. Yeah. Well, I think he's come from the biases and heuristics um, perspective, which I can understand how you become negative after looking at that sort of stuff because, my goodness, we're just so many distortions in that context. But if you look at, for example, someone like Gary Klein, who's looking at um, the decision-making in context, looking at expert judgment in a naturalistic decision-making environment, 
And in that case, you find, well, actually, in some cases, experts, despite the way we malign them for various judgments that go wrong, actually, there's some genuine expertise out there, which sometimes they just can't articulate. But actually, it has a, can have a very powerful effect. To give you just one example of that, which I've got from Gary Klein, there was a, um, um, a commander, I forget the title, but anyway, someone in charge of a ship, the HMS Gloucester or something, I think it was, in the Gulf War. And um, in this context, there were, I think, American planes flying back over the, this, this ship, uh, coming back from sorties over Iraq or something. And this guy was watching these planes coming back over the radar and they didn't have their friend or foe signifier on. So he couldn't tell what they were, but they're all these American planes flying sometimes straight over his, his boat. But he was always, he was thinking about this sidewinder missile or something, anyway, some type of missile that, that might be fired at his, at his ship as well. And he's watching all these things come over and then, and then he froze and he saw this blip on his radar and he thought, that's a missile. And he got a second radar to check. Yep, it was a missile and he shot it down. And Gary Klein then has gone back and analysed, well, how did you know? And he said, oh, well, I can tell from the radar. And they went, yeah, but how? Oh, well, it seemed to be accelerating off the coast. And, well, actually, the radar didn't show it was accelerating. It had the same blip as every other dot on his radar. It was going at the same speed. All that was different was its altitude, which he couldn't judge from that radar. I didn't tell him the altitude. And so they're going, well, how did you possibly know that this, of all the ones, this is the one you shot down? And he thought he had ESP. He just thought, I don't know how this happened. <laughs> anyway, that, when, they, when they go digging far enough, what they realized was that because the missile was at a lower altitude, it just took longer to register on the radar because it had to get away from the clutter of the um, coastline. And what he noticed, although not consciously, but what he noticed was it just the blip took longer to appear on his radar. So it sort of appeared mid-screen rather than at the edge of the screen, sort of. Thing. Yeah, I don't know if it was mid, but anyway, it took, it, there was a bigger there was a bigger gap there. Now he. In his case, it was subconscious because he wasn't aware of it, but he had he was in an environment where he had re received a whole lot of feedback because he'd been watching these blips come flying over him. So he had good feedback, but the decision-making process behind him making a judgment was beyond his awareness. So those sorts of things. So Daniel Kahneman, I think, has been against sort of the judgment and, and gut feeling and all that sort of stuff and uh, can understand where he's coming from because in many cases it leads us astray. Whereas Gary Klein is saying, well, in some cases, actually, it can really help you, even if you can't articulate it. So I think there's a bit of balance in there. And I definitely read, recommend reading some of Gary Klein's stuff. He's got several books out there as well, which are well worth a read if you want to balance it against uh, Daniel Kahneman. Yeah, he's, he's written some great stuff. I remember one of his books where he's talking about his work with firefighters mm. and very similar sort of experiences that they're in a situation and many times they respond to a fire and they don't even know what it was that tipped them off that, you know, for example, they might be in a building and the floor beneath them is about to collapse. But an experienced firefighter will, will know that uh, because they've received enough feedback and they've built up an expert intuition. And he, um, he describes that process of how you do build up an expert intuition very well. So they're, they're probably two. And the other one I think we might have mentioned on the way through is James Montier. So it's worth having a look at some of his work, I think. Um, he brings together some of this sort of stuff in a in a professional investment context. I think quite well. Yes, and he's a very funny guy too. He's uh, his little book of behavioural investing, I think it's called, is a is a great short read, uh, w which will give you some great background on a lot of these topics. Mm. Or the big book of behavioural. It's not called the big book in behavioural investing, but it is a much thicker yes. sort of textbook like one, which is again I think I'd recommend as well. Okay, so final question, and then I'll let you go. What are three things that investors, individuals, and groups could do today to improve their investment decision making? Wow, three things. Um, I think broadly you have to look at, at the one of the conclusions, which is we just know less than we think we know. That there's massive overconfidence in our industry. So where does that lead us? Well, it probably means that we should be doing less in many cases than more. Uh, which means probably trading less frequently, for example, um, certainly individual invest. Well, sorry, again, depends on the context, but individual traders, for example, we go back and look at uh, Barbara and Dean, I guess, um, for, for a good example of this one. But trading less frequently, which at, at an individual level, and I think it also links then into um, um, in some of the broad research about the characteristics of asset managers, their the lower frequency trader ones tend to have higher alpha than, than, than higher uh, frequency ones. And again, there's tax and other things in there as well. Um, so doing less, 
two, I think, would be becoming more self-aware. I mean, I think some of this sort of stuff, again, we've, we've touched on the idea that this is, it feels like it's about somebody else. It doesn't feel like it's about me. So understanding, again, this goes back to sort of having humility. I don't know as much as I think it actually applies to me. I need to understand my context and how I might feel, how I might be influenced uh, would be a second thing. And then thirdly, maybe it's around that group decision-making piece, which is, again, linking to the same sorts of concepts. Maybe I don't know as much as I think I know. Maybe I need to have humility around my, the decision-making context. But actually, maybe other people can contribute more to my decision-making than I might like to think. Be they holding me to account or be they giving me different perspectives, be they playing devil's advocate, maybe that's, that might be number three. Okay. Some great tips there. Thank you very much for spending some time with us talking about your work and about behavioral finance more broadly. And hopefully we can have you on the podcast again. Sounds Thanks. good. Thanks Simon, for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the i3 podcast. For more information, please visit www.i3-invest.com. Thank you very much.